Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar presentation titled How to Evaluate a Distributed SQL Solution, brought to you by MariaDB. Before we get started, and while we're waiting for some people to hop over from previous meetings and whatnot, um, we do have a poll for you that we're interested in your responses. It should be showing on your screen now. If you could take the second to respond to this, that would be lovely, and we'll go ahead and get started with the presentation in a minute or two here. I would like to introduce you to our presenter today, Andrew C. Oliver. Andrew has been hacking databases since age 10 and coding since age eight. He founded the open source project Apache POI and was an early hand at JBoss Incorporated. He writes a column for InfoWorld and lives with his family in a big old Victorian house in Savannah. I'd like to do a quick sound check for Andrew. So Andrew, go ahead and say hello to our audience. And audience, let me know if you can hear him. Hey everyone, how's it going today? Perfect, it looks like we're good to go on your end, Andrew. And we're gonna go ahead and end this poll here. So thank you for your responses. And would we like to see the responses now, Andrew? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Well, as you can see, uh, uh, quite a few of you are in exactly the right place. If you're not sure what uh, what distributed SQL is, or you um, are researching it, or you uh, uh, already have plans to use it, then um, then this is a great place for you. Or if you're if you're using one and wondering uh, if you should be using another, this is uh, this will give you some ideas on what to look for. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> All right. So today we're going to talk, as mentioned, how to evaluate a distributed SQL solution. We'll talk about what distributed SQL is. We'll talk about distributed SQL use cases, key features, evaluation criteria. We'll talk a little bit, a bit about what you should do when designing a POC and more particularly what you should not do. And then we'll uh, talk about some of the cost considerations. So first off, if you think about a traditional relational database, you've got queries executed on one node. So on the left, I've got your typical topology, a read-write only node, you've got one server, you go to the server. If you're, uh, uh, if you're over the age of 30 or 35 or so, then uh, this probably is how you started out uh, uh, in your professional career. Um, then, uh, uh, usually you end up saying, okay, I, one, I either need more availability or I uh, uh, have exceeded the capacity for reads or, or what have you. So traditional relational databases, you end up uh, then still running all the queries on one, on one node at a time. You, re you replicate on write, you might have some nodes that are dedicated to read write and some are read only. Um, uh, one of the problems with this, though, is that 1 plus 1 does not equal 2. So 1 plus 1 equals 1.8, 2 plus 1 equals 2.5, and so on and so forth, because when you add more nodes, you don't double the capacity of the system, especially in terms of uh, writes. So these, uh, this doesn't scale all that well, but it's uh, rather low latency. Um, so if you hit these, uh, if you do a simple key value lookup, uh, it's you know one hop to the the, the best latencies uh, over on the left hand side. Well, the best latencies on your laptop. Who am I kidding? But the best latencies over there on the left hand side with uh, one read write node, no load balancer, no hops. You go direct the database. If it's not busy, then uh, then that's the fastest you could get, right? Distributed SQL queries can be executed on any node. Writes are executed on more than one node. And a lot of distributed SQL databases are able to parallelize, parallelize and push down queries and what have you. So writes are executed on more than one node. Um, uh, it offers linear scalability. So if I add one, you know, if I, if I, you start with three, but if I double the capacity of the system, I, uh, or if I double the number of uh, VMs, nodes, containers, whatever on the system, I double the, uh, the performance of the system. The architecture is inherently scalable. Transaction coordination is required because writes are done on at least uh, at least two nodes. 
um, transactions have to be coordinated. And in order to balance the load and make this more scalable, uh, tables are partitioned. So you, you see here with, um, I'm not sure whether you see on this uh, go to meeting my uh, mouse pointer, but on the left-hand side, you see the, uh, the node one, you see table one, partition one, and it's being replicated. Uh, you've got table one, partition one, replica two. Um, so you end up with uh, at least one copy of all the data for availability reasons. So I can lose node one and that's fine. Um, but this takes transaction coordination. You have to make sure the write happened on both of those nodes. This happens automatically, of course, but when you have a transaction and a write happens, the transaction is essentially distributed. Um, this architecture inherently has higher latency than the traditional database because we've already got more hops, right? We've got a load balancer. Um, we've got to do writes on at least two nodes. Um, if you read on, say, node five data that's actually on uh, node one, then it's got to go find, it's got to go get that data. Um, so in essence, this has higher latency, but scales linearly. So writes in distributed SQL, each row, can, the, the magic that makes this work is each row contains a shard key. I've created a conceptual view of this over here. This is not actually how it works that the hash begins with five and therefore it goes to node five, but conceptually in your middle, mental model, this, uh, this works. But um, uh, hashes are assigned to nodes and distributed evenly or in ranges. Some distributed SQL databases uh, and some distributed databases go for ranges as opposed to distributing them evenly. Some do a combination of both. Um, it, uh, it just depends. But hashes are assigned to nodes. So basically, instead of a primary key alone, you have this shard key. And the shard key basically gets hashed. And that could be my name if, uh, if that were uh, unique, or it could be something else. Um, so it gets hashed, and that hash determines what node it gets assigned, assigned to. Those um, are what partition it gets assigned to. Um, transactions are coordinated via a consensus algorithm like Raft or Paxos. Those are the, the I think they're the only two I know of that are actually deployed in distributed SQL databases at the moment. Queries are executed on, uh, oh, the other, yeah. Queries are executed on any node. Uh, clauses and execute uh, clauses can be ex uh, can be executed uh, and distributed. So in this case, and this isn't in every distributed SQL database, but most of them can do this sort of uh, clause push down. So here I'm doing this uh, sort of this is a Northwind database kind of uh, select from orders. Uh, with order line items and, and, and what have you. So orders with their line items. And then I limited, I want orders from Georgia of product number four, whatever that means. Um, so I end up pushing down, hey, give me every order from state of Georgia ends up pulling from uh, a couple different nodes. So here I've got table one, partition one and partition two. So I've got matching rows potentially from both of those. Uh, so I end up parallelizing this read if that makes sense. So if I've got four partitions and uh, each of those has a replica, I could potentially pull from uh, rows from eight nodes all at the same time, kind of maximizing my resources. Um, I can also push down that I want my uh, order line items and, and potentially execute that in, in parallel based on, uh, based on some criteria. So, uh, so I, SQL pushdown allows me to parallelize things. Partitions allow me to parallelize things. I can really kind of distribute my workload in a way that I can't with a traditional uh, relational database. So we all went on this long trip uh, where we were told that uh, relational databases don't scale. So we all have to go to this uh, initially, some of the first ones were key value stores and then document databases. A lot of things, though, are really pretty relational and relational algebra and SQL are pretty powerful technologies, but we were told we can't have joins, we can't 
have this, we can't have that. Um, and part of the reason why is that consensus algorithms were kind of under development and being made uh, uh, really perfected or what have you during that time. So most distributed SQL databases are built on some of the same underlying technologies as NoSQL databases, but then consensus algorithms were the fa uh, key to multi-phase commits at cloud scale. Um, Paxos, uh, so our database at MariaDB is called, our distributed SQL database called Expand. We use Paxos. Um, uh, some of the other, and I think, uh, I think Spanner uses Paxos. Some of the uh, other more, some of the other database, uh, distributed SQL databases use Raft. Um, for all intents and purposes, these are equivalent. They're a way to do a multi, phase commit and do group membership um, uh, uh, and basically develop a consensus. Yes, this this uh, this row is the current version and uh, ready to, to, to commit or, or what have you. Um, Google Spanner paper validated and popular, it wasn't the first distributed SQL database, but it validated and popularized the concept. Um, but Google's uh, Spanner relied on hardware atomic clocks, which uh, didn't uh, didn't really scale to uh, to running on multiple different types of VMs, running uh, on your own hardware, running on other clouds, et cetera, et cetera. Um, only academic egg hags really care about the difference between Paxos and RAF and argue which is better. Then there's other papers that say, well, after it's after it's all said and done, they're roughly equivalent. Um, Paxos was harder to implement. Uh, Raft uh, Raft was developed later and kind of uh, and is simpler to, to implement. So when should you use a distributed SQL database? Well, if you've ever developed, a, a, if you're developing, especially on an older page based or any of those sort of things, and you're running into a lot of locking issues where you think parallelization would, uh, would help you, that uh, that's a good case for using distributed SQL. Um, if you need to do online schema changes, um, uh, I think we are one of the, the distributed SQL databases that uh, supports Atomic uh, DDL and uh, other features that make it possible to, to do your schema changes uh, uh, in production. Uh, faster backup times because you can run, if you run on a traditional relational database, the way that you may have to do a full backup is obviously going to affect your per production performance. Um, cost of operations, maybe you need higher availability and, and better disaster recovery. Um, one of the key reasons is you may have exceeded the capacity of your relational database in terms of how many users are hitting this thing. Um, we've got customers who are in in the hundreds of thousands of queries per second and transactions per second. So if you're running that kind of scale, then you may want uh, to move distributed SQL. Storage needs may exceed the capacity of a relational database. Um, but then another thing that, uh, that comes up is you may have found the limits of your NoSQL clustering technology because some of the NoSQL databases have a, a more, a less, uh, a less parallel, a less uh, uh, sort of flat architecture as far as the uh, clustering technology. Um, if you're on a traditional database, you may need more cloud-friendly architecture. A lot of people moving to the cloud are, are looking to consolidate multiple different database technologies into a distributed SQL ar architecture. They may not on any one database have exceeded the, uh, the power of, uh, of, uh, of a traditional related relational database, but they may have, um, uh, but when they combine multiple different schemas and technologies uh, into one database uh, or fewer databases for operational simplicity, they may actually have uh, exceeded the capacity. Um, and uh, some people, hey, Rack's expensive and it's complicated, so some folks are, are moving distributed SQL because they've exceeded or they, they'll do anything basically to be free of Rack. Um, so when to consider an alternative um, to a distributed SQL database, you may not need a distributed SQL database. If your data fits cleanly on one node, you've got a traditional RDBMS that gives you sufficient throughput, 
you have low writes and simply need to scale reads and a traditional single read write with multiple read onlys is sufficient, or you need uh, 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 lower latency more than you need scale, um, then uh, it could be that a traditional relational database is, is perfectly fine. Just have a primary and uh, multiple uh, 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 secondaries or to uh, mul or a multi-master configuration that may be enough for you. Uh, uh, you may not need this, if, uh, especially for smaller operations. So let's talk about some of the key features. The key feature is distribution of the workload, um, uh, but distribution of the workload comes at a cost. So if you do, I think this is like uh, uh, the same same kind of thing you got uh, at the beginning. If you do. Uh, of, of distributed computing. If you do a select star from order line items where order ID equals 42, which returns like eight rows, um, that's gonna be faster on a traditional relational database um, with, you know, especially with one node than it will be on a distributed database. But it won't necessarily be faster when uh, 10,000 users do that same query. So here we're, we're uh, worried about latency at scale not at not at low throughput so it's uh it's uh this is a truck rather than a uh than a two-door sports car if you will um distributed sql database have been proved in production at rates as high as 120 transactions per second um uh so really look at your your throughput look at your latency requirements um and, and that sort of thing the second thing is elasticity. So adding a node and scaling out is a nice trip, but removing one uh, is, uh, is an even better trick, especially 2020 where we had times where people hit everything at once and then we're gone two days later, right? So workloads scale out, but they also scale back. What you need if you're in retail on Cyber Monday may not be what you need two weeks later. Um, so you may want to scale back the number of nodes and distributed SQL architectures uh, tolerate that well. Consistency, if this were all about scale, or if this were all about uh, scale, then you might just use uh, a key value store. Um, but systems of record require true consistency. So part of the distributed SQL uh, interest at the moment is when we first moved to some distributed databases, especially in the uh, distributed databases, what we were really focused on was scale, and we were focused on a, a certain type of system where we had high customer volume or high high number of people hitting it. But uh, but in a lot of cases, gee, if you're a social, you know, some of the first ones were developed by social networks. If you're a social network and maybe somebody doesn't see the uh, see a consistent profile update until the next time they re refresh, big deal. But uh, systems of record have been are now moving to the cloud. And as we move systems of record to the cloud and the data volumes for the systems of record uh, are getting larger, now we need a different kind of database that provides true consistency. Some databases, say, okay, we added acid transactions and then there's a big asterisk by it and it tells you to never use it, and et cetera, et cetera. Or if you have used it, you start to realize it's not the same thing as you were used to on a, on a MySQL, MariaDB, Oracle, whatever, um, uh, that you need something a little bit more consistent. And the consistency in distributed SQL databases should be on par with uh, traditional relational databases. SQL support, so by definition, all distributed SQL databases support the SQL query language, otherwise it's not a uh, distributed SQL database. They differ in terms of dialect and overall compatibility. Uh, some of the distributed SQL databases are Postgres SQL based. Um, I'm from MariaDB, so obviously ours is MariaDB MySQL compatible, but we've also added compatibility with Oracle PL SQL type stuff. So there's a compatibility mode where you can also run some of your uh, uh, Oracle stuff with uh, with you, if any changes. High availability is a is 
obviously one of the most important parts and cluster sizes start as th at three as a result. So you're not going to deploy a distributed SQL database with one node or two nodes, uh, obviously. Um, so tables are sliced up into partitions. Partitions are replicated to at least one node. Uh, that's your replication factor. And then some databases are zone aware. So they ensure the replica, uh, replicas are in another availability zone, or if you're running on-premise, you might say that's rack aware. Backups can occur online and in parallel. Cross data center and regional replication is usually asynchronous with relaxed consistency. Some of the distributed SQL databases advertise that they can do consistency across uh, geographic uh, regions. Um, this is sort of an edge case. This is probably not something you're going to do for a very many data sets because it's an edge use case. Meaning if I'm in the UK and I'm updating, you know, dealing with my orders, my data, I don't really want to be re redirected to the US and do it there at the same time. And uh, if so, I'm probably going to work on a different data set. I don't need to coordinate transactions between it. And generally, if I fail over, uh, then uh, I've got bigger problems than the uh, than the uh, I've got bigger problems than the the consistency of that uh, data set. So it's it tends to be a rare and edge case. It's an advertising feature. Generally, you're not actually going to use it. You're going to do relaxed consistency and traditional like. WAN style replication uh, across uh, zones. Why, or sorry, across regions. Why, because the latency uh, would require that every transaction commit be coordinated across those geographic regions. So it's possible, it's just not a good idea. Evaluation criteria, all distributed SQL vendors claim to have a DBAS, but um, uh, not all of them are available in production yet. Many organizations run private clouds for security or due to network latency. Some are both public and private. Uh, and then most organizations are multi-cloud. So one of the things that you want to look at is, gee, does this, if you want a, a distributed SQL in the database as a service, do they have real customers in production yet? Um, uh, can they run on your private cloud if that's important to you? Um, can they run on both public and private? And if so, can you replicate between, say, GCP and AWS or a private cloud and, and GCP or, or what have you? So um, most organizations are kind of multi-cloud um, and, and that's probably going to expand rather than contract, especially if we have another one of those uh, nice, uh, nice uh, regional outages that take down the internet uh, on occasion. Throughput and scalability, higher throughput is a significant reason we choose distributed SQL solutions, but different choices affect the overall, different architecture will choices affect the overall capability. So ultimately you wanna run your workload at the right throughput on the right number of nodes and with the right capabilities named. Um, scale goes out and back again. So can you scale up and, or can you scale out and can you scale back? Uh, when you add a node, does it automatically rebalance in a, an appropriate amount of time? And what about if a uh, node is removed? When it rebalances, uh, are you able to keep up with your workload? These are things you want to look at when you evaluate a distributed SQL database. When you create your, your, your POC or, or you're looking to evaluate a relation or a distributed SQL database, you want to look at latency as a budget. If you just say, oh, when I run a single uh, single query that returns eight rows, uh, is my newfangled distributed SQL database uh, faster than my uh, than my uh, MariaDB that runs uh, on my laptop? Well, the answer is no, um, not for one user, one query, small data set. The uh, traditional database will be faster. But we want to look at latency as budget because we're really concerned about what about when a thousand users, ten thousand users do it? Can we keep up with this workload? What about when it's more complex queries or or um, uh, writes and what have you? So we want to look at latency as a budget. Say if your standard is that the page has drawn three seconds and right now it's drawing two, then you've got a thousand milliseconds to work. 
uh, with including late network latency to the database. That's a long period of time uh, for any of these uh, distributed SQL databases. They should all perform well under uh, uh, well under 100 milliseconds or less, actually. Uh, so some SQL databases are paired with an unrelated Cassandra knockoff. So uh, that, which I found out is now being abbreviated C star. I thought it'd be kind of funnier to do C seven uh, A to to work like with uh, uh, Kubernetes uh, Cades, but um, these don't uh, have actual distributed SQL capabilities. So some of the distributed SQL databases are claiming low latency and sub millisecond latency and all that. But usually, if you dig under the covers. They're not actually doing a distributed SQL database at that point. They've really given you their own version of Cassandra that's not compatible with, uh, with the actual distributed SQL part. Availability, uh, different partitions are stored in different availability zones. An entire availability zone can go down without a loss of service. Most regions have three availability zones, some have four. Um, this is obviously something you'll want to test in your evaluation, trust, but verify, as, as they say. So you want to um, make sure that this works in your, uh, your evaluation uh, in a way that meets your, avail your uh, high availability requirements. In your evaluation, you want to look at compatibility. Uh, SQL to distributed SQL, one moment, please. SQL to distributed SQL is about as much effort as going between two relational databases uh, unless it's compatible with your specific dialect. So dialect compatibility, obviously, if you're on MariaDB or MySQL, uh, 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 shameless plug here, we'll, we'll be an obvious, uh, uh, our expand product will be an obvious uh, choice there. If you're um, on Oracle or one of those databases, um, uh, then you want to look at what features it has to support your uh, your oracleisms. Cost is uh, a really big consideration here, and the biggest mistake you can make is go and look at the uh, the uh, instance per hour rate because that's not the whole cost story. And there are clever things that uh, remind me of '90s cell phone providers that can be done in the uh, in the cloud where if you asked, how much will my phone cost each month? And there was no way to know. Um, uh, so cost is a uh, is a big thing here. You want to look at, OK, yes, the licenses. You want to look at, uh, uh, if you're on a DVAS, the cloud instance uh, rate. But you also need to look at IOPS, because in a lot of cases, uh, the cost on the cloud for IOPS exceeds your, well, generally, for a database, exceeds your instance cost, which you're really just paying for CPU, by um, by a lot. And in many cases, most of your cost is, is going to be there. You want to look at risk of outages, staff training, overall maintenance, existing sunk costs. So if you're on a traditional database and um, you're having trouble uh, maintaining DBA staff and, and that sort of stuff, and it'd be nice to outsource the uh, maintain maintenance of uh, all of these database instances and and uh, infrastructure, then that's something to look at. Um, overall maintenance, how, how much trouble is to maintain it? And then, but if you've already got the staff to maintain this thing and you've got these, this hardware or whatever, maybe you want to consider an on-premise uh, distributed SQL database. When you design a POC, um, try to use your real schema and uh, workload or some representation that's as close as possible. Uh, that's as close as possible, but you may require some adaptation. So in any distributed database, sequences are bad. Um, uh, if you don't have to use a sequence, if you can use an auto-generated key uh, or a natural key, that'll give you higher performance. Uh, a sequence goes down to a mutex at some point, so somewhere a thread's going to get synchronized. Uh, you want to test realistic limits. So one of the things that uh, some people do, oh, it's a distributed SQL data. Is it really better than my old database? Well, I'm going to create this join that does 15 joins with six tables and pulls back 1 uh, million rows. Um, that's not a realistic test of your, your regular workload in, in most cases. So, so you don't want to test that. You want to test, can it run your regular workload at a, at a latency you expect, at a scale you expect, or a scale that meets your needs? Um, and then single row point queries with low load uh, will perform worse on this, any distributed SQL database 
than a uh, than a well apportioned client server database. So uh, so that that shouldn't be part of your POC. And then set a realistic sustained latency requirement to meet at various expected loads, like 20 millis. If you're doing you know a lot of just single row queries or whatever, 20 milliseconds would be a reasonable sustained latency requirements at various uh, at various loads. Look at it a holistic budget, but you know set yourself a reasonable sustained latency requirement. Other things to consider is that most of these distributed SQL databases are paired with other things. Um, and, and part of this is we are kind of moving to an era where we had general databases. Most people who bought Oracle or used Oracle back in the 90s or the early 2000s used it for quote unquote everything. They used it for analytics. They used it for, they used it for transactions. They used it for, for all their requirements. And then we moved to this polyglot persistence era, right tool for the right job, but we don't really need duplicate hardware and our workloads are, are uh, not evenly distributed and what have you. So in a lot of cases, these are paired with other things. Um, some of these support smart transactions, so they'll support a hybrid transaction. We called it HTAP for a while. The analysts are renaming this, but uh, but it was called HTAP, Hybrid Transaction Analytical Processing, for a while. Um, uh, we call it Smart Transactions. So this is, think about uh, if you're doing that Northwind database and order management system or something, you might also on one page, uh, on the same page, show uh, what your past orders look like. That's a semi-analytical query, not a pure transactional query. And you can, in some cases, pair those together. Um, a big thing you should look at is load balancing. So it's not strictly part of the distributed SQL database, but uh, how is load done? And what happens to in-flight uh, transactions? So in some of these, the answer is the client has to be smart enough in the event of a failure to replay the transactions that failed. Um, uh, in some of these cases, there's a, uh, a load balancer that's paired with the uh, distributed SQL database that's able to replay transactions. Uh, also, is the load balancer itself high availability? You might have no single point of failure in the database, but the load balancer might. Some use smart proxies or other tricks to rely on the client to know who to talk to. All of these schemes tend to fail um, uh, at some type of uh, uh, outage. Um, for instance, you might lose a zone or you might lose, use a, lose a region and all of the nodes that the uh, client knew how to contact in the smart proxy might be lost. Um, IOP budgeting is a, is a big thing you should consider. On one hand, you might want to maximize scale and just say, hey, uh, here's, hey, Amazon or Google, here's, or Azure, here's my wallet, just uh, take what you need. Or you may want to say, hey, uh, if we go above this many IOPS or, or something like that, then uh, then uh, shut that down. Some distributed SQL databases, such as ours, are capable of, of configuring provisioned IOPS. Um, you also want to look at DBAS and other topologies. So if you're looking at uh, you know what are the capabilities of the DBAS in terms of management and all of that, and can it work with uh, hybrid uh, replication? So basically, can I replicate a local to a uh, to a uh, public cloud? We have additional resources you guys can look at. Um, uh, so there's a distributed SQL page on Wikipedia if you want to start there. Um, uh, we will have a uh, distributed SQL getting started uh, ref card at DZone uh, available soon. Um, so I'm sure you'll be getting a, an email about that at some point. And then um, if you want to look at MariaDB uh, expand, then you can check out the uh, MariaDB expand fact sheet. And uh, we, uh, you can try it uh, uh, with a $500 credit towards, your, uh, towards whatever you end up using. And now I'd like to take any questions you guys have. Um, that's my Twitter handle. If you want to, um, uh, uh, if you want to uh, read my name rantings about uh, about airlines and uh, and hotels or whatever, um, and then uh, uh, also um, that's my email address. If you have uh, additional questions that uh, that you don't uh, didn't get a chance to answer uh, ask uh, on this uh, webinar, um, or maybe you're watching it on replay. 
Um, so if that, uh, so that's uh, that's all I have. And uh, do we have any questions? Perfect. Thank you for that, Andrew. Um, and like he said, please go ahead and submit any questions you may have into the questions panel, so he can answer them uh, live right now. And again, make sure to kind of keep his contact info in mind in case some more questions come up down the road. Um, with that being said, we do have a few questions. And the first one of that is, how does auto balancing work in the event a node is lost or added? So that's a good question. So in the event a node is lost or added, remember that we use, um, uh, that we partition our um, our tables. So um, so we partition tables, and since we partition those tables, we have if we lose a node, then um, then we lose all those partitions. So uh, distributed SQL database should be able to um, to look at that uh, new new uh, topology, and then it'll create another, since I've got this replica here, uh, table one, partition one, replica two on node two, all the database will create a new replica of that uh, and put it on one of the other nodes. Um, algorithmically, it'll figure out based on the workload where where load is going and uh, and whether it needs to, um, where it should put that first based on which one's most busy or not. Um, it also may at some point, uh, re, if we add more nodes, it may re-slice the uh, partitions. So essentially, we may, we may end up with additional partitions of the same table in order to balance that workload. Great, thank you for that. That was super informative. And we do have some audience questions coming in. Some more of them for you, Andrew. Um, one of those being, how is distributed SQL going to be helpful in Oracle databases? Um, so this is an alternative uh, technology. So distributed SQL is a different type of database. So where Oracle's a client-server database, distributed SQL is a uh, is basically a, a, a more similar database to a uh, NoSQL database, but um, but meets the same sort of expectations you'd have of Oracle or or any other type of uh, relational database. So generally people on Oracle are looking to migrate to other things, especially as they move to the cloud. So this would be something you would use to replace a traditional Oracle database. And the way that, you know, when you look at it, you'll you'll want to look at one that offers some Oracle compatibility features, such as some PL SQL and, and other things like that. So in essence, this is a, uh, a replacement for for uh, uh, Oracle rather than a uh, complementary technology. Although some people are basically moving some of their uh, some of their workload to distributed SQL and then complementing it, uh, 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 especially if they've got a lot of PL SQL and, and complicated uh, uh, proprietary uh, stuff that they use on Oracle, then they're moving some stuff to distributed SQL and then uh, running some stuff uh, on, uh, on Oracle. Nice, thank you for that clarification. It was very detailed, and I'm sure our audience member appreciated that. Um, moving on to another question, Andrew, and this this audience member is wondering: Is distributed SQL good for a microservices architecture? Yeah, distributed SQL is a really good choice. So when you go about a microservices architecture, what you're hoping to be able to do is one, deploy things, and um, and uh, you know, handle workload between your different microservices, and you're hoping to to have greater availability by being able to to tolerate one of those uh, instances go down and all that kind of stuff. So it's a very complementary tech technology for a microservices architecture, um, especially when you're trying to have greater availability um, uh, uh, and be able to do change uh, change in uh, in your deployment and production as your system evolves. Great. And Christian, an audience member, is wondering, what is the typical failover time in case of zone failures? Um, so that is, 
going to be heavily implementation dependent. Um, in the case of, so I can only, I'll have to answer this as a, as a product specific question. In the case of uh, uh, our, our enterprise or SkySQL um, uh, product, it should be, um, the failover should be pretty quick in, in unless there were a lot of um, uh, writes that need to be replayed. So you may have a slight pause while it runs, while we have a product called, Ma or a feature, feature called MaxScale, which is uh, essentially a HA load balancer that can do transaction replay. Um, so if you have that turned on, then you'll have to wait for the inbound transactions to be replayed. Um, uh, you won't notice this other than it'll be a, a slight delay. Um, this should be something measured usually in milliseconds, um, uh, uh, unless you, you know, had a lot of inbound transactions or whatever that had to be replayed. So this should be measured in milliseconds, um, uh, could be seconds if you have a lot of uh, transactions being replayed. Good to know that it will definitely be a short failover time. Okay, let's jump into another one. Um, this attendee is wondering, do all the nodes need to be of the same model and size? So this is one of these like, no, but um, for SkySQL, our, you know, this is going to get a little product specific. For SkySQL, we do have them all the same, uh, same uh, size. Could you do that? Yes. Is it a good idea? Probably not. So it's like, do you have to versus will it work? Well, you can make it work. Um, it wouldn't be my preference. We appreciate your honesty. Okay, let's keep going. Another one here from Ivan, he is wondering, does distributed SQL support unstructured big data? If so, can you give a scenario? Okay, um, so uh, this is gonna be implementation dependent. Um, uh, so for, um, for uh, our, uh, our product for uh, Expand, and actually, most of them do support some sort of uh, uh, do support the SQL JSON standard. Um, uh, but for expand, we we support JSON objects, and you can basically have a JSON column. We also actually have um, another feature coming coming out where you'll be able to do um, uh, query a JSON object as a table. Um, but uh, but that's not in a in a current production release yet. But uh, but yeah, so you can store JSON objects and query JSON objects. Um, uh, uh, as far as other types of unstructured data for SkySQL and MariaDB's product line, we couple our distributed SQL database with um, a column store. So if you wanted to do basically smart transactions where you're coupling some transaction processing with some analytical processing, um, you could do that. It's a little different than what you're asking, except a lot of times that comes from un unstructured uh, data. But keep in mind that distributed SQL databases are transactional databases. Um, so uh, uh, I, uh, I would say the quote unquote big data tends to be an analytical database term. Sometimes people use it to mean larger than a spreadsheet, but uh, but uh, tends to be an analytical database term. Uh, these are transactional databases, so you're not going to replace uh, replace uh, uh, Teradata with uh, MariaDB expand if you're using Teradata to calculate terabyte cube, multi-dimensional cubes or something like that. Um, but yeah, unstructured data stored in a JSON uh, column or uh, uh, or potentially used in smart transactions is absolutely something that uh, that you can do with uh, a distributed SQL database or complementary technology. Great, good to know. 
We have an audience member wondering if you could kind of elaborate on the differences between distributed SQL and NoSQL databases. Um, sure. So the most obvious difference is that distributed SQL databases are relational databases. They're SQL databases. You create tables. You have uh, 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 foreign keys. You have primary keys. All of that kind of good stuff. So if you're coming from a relational database background, this is this is what you're used to. Um, uh, the other big difference is transactional integrity. While most NoSQL databases do now claim ACID transactions, when you dig under the covers, they're not doing real ACID transactions. One of them, uh, in particular, that uh, that I, I have more technical detail in my head on, uh, able to recall, uh, actually uses client-side transactions. This is the old, uh, the kind of way that JMS used to work or what have you, where basically it's a client-side transaction, not even a server-side transaction. Um, so if you need real ACID transaction support, this is probably more the technology you're, you're looking for. So yes, they're SQL. Yes, they're relational. They still have the same kind of uh, scale out architecture. Um, if you look under under the covers, a lot of the same t storage technologies are used. Um, but real acid transaction uh, uh, acid transactions, consensus algorithms to manage that multi phase commit. Well, good to know. I believe you answered that question beautifully. Okay, we do have a good like five more questions here for you so let's just keep on going um another audience member is wondering is there any effort to reduce latency by doing hardware offloading like gpus so no and part of why not is that databases are not typically especially transactional databases are not typically CPU bound, um, they're storage bound. So if you want to reduce latency, you load more data in the memory uh, aggressively, um, not offload CPU to GPU. And if you were looking at graph processing or something like that, then GPUs make sense because then you're doing path calculations of that stuff of that nature. But in this particular case, um, I'm not a real hardware geek, but I'm not, I'm not clear on how that would address the main latency issue. The main latency issue in this sort of technology comes to the fact that we've got uh, extra network hops, and then we have to do transaction coordination, uh, offloading the CPU, which is not where that's happening, um, uh, to GPU wouldn't actually reduce latency. Okay, thank you for that. Um, can this be deployed on GKE? Yes. Okay. Perfect. As well as uh, 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 as well as uh, uh, any of the other uh, cloud vendor Kubernetes uh, implementations uh, for our SkySQL product, we actually internally use uh, GKE for Google, and then we use um, uh eks on uh, amazon um uh so and if you you know decide to deploy yourself then obviously you can deploy both on straight kubernetes or um or any of your cloud provider kubernetes right okay uh a few more here um another attendee is wondering is time series data querying supported um, yes and no. Uh, so in general, this is, if, if you were just doing straight only time series data or what have you, um, that's sort of more of a, a, a Cassandra style thing. We do support all of the, uh, all of the sort of robust functionality that RIAdB has on that. Obviously you have a little bit more latency, uh, on a, uh, distributed SQL database than you do on like an actual time series database. Okay, awesome. Um, 
I believe our last question of the attendees um, comes from Aditya. And they are wondering, it's kind of a long question, so let me know if you would like it to be reread. Um, but if a record write is ongoing and is being synced with the replicas, are reads to the same records blocked until the replicas are updated to the latest state? So if a record write is be yes. Uh, so, uh, so this is going to be implementation dependent, um, but, uh, uh, but uh, on most distributed SQL databases, the answer is yes. Uh, so that's a transaction lock. So if you have a transaction and the record's being written, um, when we're syncing with the replicas, we're basically doing a multi-phase uh, 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 commit. Um, uh, so reads that have to wait until the uh, replicas are brought to the state. So this is uh, synchronous replication essentially uh, uh, during that. And if they weren't, then you'd have a transaction uh, violation. There are some databases that will do an optimistic style lock here. And basically you pay more uh, on the back end. So then when you go and try and commit, you find out that you were doing a read based on an old version of it, and you also have to actually write code to SQL code to, to allow for that, and then have the transaction fail, and then you have to make the client redo it. Um, for uh, MariaDB, we've always been a little bit more pessimistic for that particular uh, scenario, but we do support multi-version. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. And then we did just have one more question pop in here, so my apologies. Um, but this question reads, what, at what size should a company decide that now it's time to move to a distributed SQL? That's a great question. So it's, it's a little more complicated than just size. Um, so there's also concurrency. Um, uh, there's also cost, and there's also, um, uh, if you've got several different databases now and you're trying to consolidate and what have you, then, then that's something to look at. Um, there's no specific size, but if you're struggling to meet your workload at a cost that you're willing to spend. So what I'm getting at there is that, uh, I can deploy a distributed SQL database right now, have high availability, meet my workload uh, needs of most applications I've ever worked on um, for, uh, for hundreds or thousands of dollars. Um, just deploying rack on three nodes costs more than my house. Um, uh, maybe, maybe more than my car, but definitely, definitely more than my car, but probably, uh, probably more than both my cars. Um, but uh, but could easily be more than my house. Um, so um, so there's a there's a third factor in there, which is if you need that availability, you need um, uh, to meet your performance requirements, and you don't want to uh, to uh, you know blow a wad on it, and maybe you want to um, to use a cloud model and pay as you go, then. Um, then uh, this may be a, a better choice for you. Um, so there's no like, oh gee, my database is, is now um, uh, 500 gigabytes. So I'll, uh, I'll go distributed SQL. It's it's more of a uh, of a time, money, cost, and um, and uh, and level of effort uh, sort of uh, sort of question. Okay, perfect. Um, Sorry, I wish I could give like this quanti this quantifiable <laughs> rather than qualitative because I know you're like, okay, that wasn't an answer. I didn't say, you know, five queries or 500 TPS and, and, you know, there's obviously a TPS thing where you just hit the wall or whatever, but if you spent, if you had unlimited amount of money, then you can make anything scale. So, uh, so this is a scalable uh, architecture that's affordable to do availability and all of that kind of stuff. So, so if you need that, that's uh, then this is a good choice for you. Right. You still gave an answer. It was great. Uh, you can't give a quantitative answer to that. So, I definitely think it kind of varies, but I would agree. 
um, that there are multiple factors in that. Um, and we are coming down to the end. And with that, Andrew Dizon would like to thank you for your phenomenal presentation and for your extensive Q&A. Uh, so thank you for sticking around for that and sharing, us, uh, sharing your knowledge with all of us. Uh, we've really appreciated that. Um, so again, thank you so much. Hey, and thank you guys. And thanks the audience. Uh, thanks to the audience. Those were some great questions. Perfect. And if we didn't get to your questions today, um, Andrew will be receiving this report so he can reach out individually and directly to you. Um, and again, his email is andrew.oliver at mariadb.com if you are interested in contacting him directly. Um, again, with that being said, Dizon would also like to thank Maria DB for providing our audience with a great webinar. Lastly today, a big thank you to everyone who attended. We hope you learned something new that will help you in your developer career. Have a great day, everyone.